I love that. I will rejoice. It's choosing your day. And letting, instead of letting your day happen, it's choosing your day. Amen? And sometimes, good days just come. Some days, good days are made. Amen? you got to make them. Amen? I run into that on a regular basis in my life. And, and some days are just, I wake up and everything just seems to fall in place. And praise God, that's a good day. And there's other days I've got to just take out time and I've got to make it a good day. Amen? That's right. I make it a good day with my attitude and adjusting it. Adjust, adjust my perspective. Find out where my focus is at. May have to refocus. Amen? If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrew. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Hebrew chapter 8. We're going to start there. We're going to talk about your covenant... Did you know God has not changed? Now, um, this is a real, it's a real misunderstanding in the study of Scripture. Because we think because we're in the New Testament that we got a new God in the whole package. Because, you know, He's not angry anymore. He's not, he's not wrathful anymore. He wasn't angry and wrathful in the Old Testament. God cannot change, and God is, his defini the definition of God is love. He is love. Okay? So God's never changed. The covenant between God and man has changed. Amen? Because the first covenant, we must it all up. And then that covenant, he worked with a group of people called, called the, 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 the Hebrews. And they wanted to be like everybody else. They had an identity crisis going on. And they wanted to be like everybody else. And God, wanted, God said, well, you're special. You're special. You're different than anybody else. Oh, we want to be just like everybody. We want to be ruled by a king. We don't, we don't, want, a, we don't want a prophet coming and talking to us. In other words, I, we don't want to hear from you. We want to sit down and decide with a government what's best for us. We don't want to hear from you. God told them, don't go over to that, don't go over to that group. Don't mix and mingle. Get you in trouble. You get into bondage. What do they do? Man, they run for those people. I mean, they, God did any more long, no longer tell them that. Now, God did not persecute them and pour his wrath out on them. They made a decision to turn from him and run to exactly what he said not to run to. Isn't it funny? Thousands of trees. You can eat of any of them. The whole place is yours. Don't touch this one. And where did they run to? To the one. Amen. See, there was law even in the garden. The law, the only law there was, was don't touch this tree. And you know what we ran to? What we ran to is humanity. The very thing that there was a law against. Paul said the law is what is what drew me and helped me understand I was a sinner. It was the law that convinced me that I needed something else. The children of Israel said, we want, we want rules so we can please you. And he says, you want rules? I'll give you rules. You want them? I'll throw Moses up here and we're going to get you some rules. And when they came back from those rules, nobody's ever been able to fulfill them. Ever. Oh, there's denominations out there who are striving. They're trying really hard and some lie and say they do fulfill them. But the Bible says no man. So I'll trust no man. I'll trust this over their confession. <laughs> How many of you know you don't know somebody until you live with them? <laughs> How many of you know if you even live with them, you might not know them really well? Amen? That's the struggle of young people when they get married. 
They thought they knew, and then they go, oh, wait a second, I did not know them. I didn't know they had a hollow leg and a false eye and false teeth, and I thought that hair was attached. I didn't, you know. They, they, I just didn't know who I was married until I got to live with them and got to know them. So, so God set this up so that we could turn to him. And then, from that point on, he kept talking to them. From the very first sacrifice, he kept talking to them about a Messiah that was coming, an, an, an absolute supreme sacrifice that was coming their way. It was prophesied from the very beginning all the way into Malachi. He kept telling them, and then all of a sudden, the prophecies became fulfilled, and Christ Jesus was born through the womb of a virgin Mary. And then he came, he lived, and he laid down his life. Nobody took it from him. We can't get these groups, hate groups, you know, because somebody killed Jesus. Well, you really drug him down to the earth now. You really drug him down to normalcy. Remember, he, and, and, and he knew these groups would come along. Denny, he knew it. So you know what he did? He set up a moment in the garden of Gethsemane where he was praying. And remember they came with pitchforks, knives, and swords, and spears, and they're coming after him. Lanterns, they're after him. And they go, are you him? And he says, I am he. And when he said, I am he, they all fell. Remember that? They fell. Out cold. By two words, or three. Wow. So nobody could take him and kill him. <laughs> because just with his words, he puts you back on your, on your backside. Just with his words. You see? See, we have teaching out there that he's going to, he, he punishes those that he loves. He chastises those. And he does chastise. But it's taught in such a way that he, it's with a, it's with a, a stick. He's going to beat you into submission. Have you ever beat anybody into submission? I can give you the answer. You have not. Even a POW, you never beat him into submission. He'll do whatever you tell him to to keep from getting another beating. But inside of him, he's still, amen, he's still who he is. And you give him, you give him a, a, an open door, and he's going to take it and run for freedom, because that's where he came from was freedom. You see, you never beat somebody into submission. So why would God use something that won't work? I don't think he will. And I'm going to show you in the Bible here in just a minute. I'm going to prove to you that he won't. Hebrews 8, chapter 8, verse number 6. I want you to look at this. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Did you hear that? We have a better covenant established on better promises. So many people want to go back to, they want to get their New Testament salvation. And then they want to live in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is an example. All those things really happen, that is history. But they are an example of the foreshadowing of things to come. And you need to understand that some scripture is written to you, and some scripture is written, well, all scripture is written for you, but not all scripture is written to you. The Bible says all scripture is good for correction, instruction, edification, okay? But not all scripture is written to you. We want to take what's not written to us and we want to use it because it benefits us, but let's turn that around on us when we fail. 
We don't like that too much. You know? We want to use it as an excuse to carry out punishment to our children. We want to use it to carry out punishment, men, to our wives because I remember my wife was not raised in church. Now, she, she got saved at a young age, but she was embarrassed to even go home and tell her mom and dad that, her, that she had gotten saved because, you know, I, when I met them, I, I remember the, one of the first, um, we'd met in September, and um, Christmas was just around the corner. I'd never been to a Christmas party like that one, you know. I got to the first, got there in the, in, 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 you know, I, we got there fairly early in the day, and um, we already had one drunk in the floor, you know. They were just relaxed, kicking back, having a good time. I'd never been around anything like that before. So that's where my wife came from. Now they're all saved now and they're going to church right now. They're all in church this morning. Um, they promised us we get the new building, have the grand opening. They will, they will fill up uh, several pews for us. They want to be here. Celebrate what God's doing. But that's just where they came from. And I remember I came from uh, church with a lot of rules. Now I remember one day I told her <laughs> The Bible says, folks, listen, gentlemen, if you have to use the Bible to get your wife's attention, I can tell you right now, you're about to get her attention, okay? And it's not going to be the way you want it to be, but you're going to get her attention. Because if you don't have a relationship, you've got to use something. And I was grabbing for straws that day. I was desperate. I said, the Bible says a woman should submit herself to the husband. out of heaven. She didn't know what that, you know. You, you, and this is how you're going to try to convince me of that? Uh -huh. You know? So we can take that scripture and use it any way we want to. You know? But see, the, 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 the portion of that is, is not as a dictator. Not as a dictator. Is that true? Yes, the woman is to submit herself to the husband. Is that true? Yes, but the husband is to become worthy of that submission. Ooh. I was not worthy of her submission at all. I was not. If you'd have told me to take a bullet for her, I'd have put her in front of me. I, you know, at that time, we were just not that close. It was the first couple years of our marriage, and we were not that close. She was not the person I dated. I woke up next to the person that I did not date. <laughs> And I know she did the same thing, you know. Where did you go? So, I mean, we, people look at us and they, they think we are just, you know, we've always been this way, but to, be the tr to tell you the truth, we truly know the power of God and his restora restoration power in marriage. We do. So, what I'm trying to get across here is the Bible is not here for us to manipulate and twist. We've got to get an understanding. God has never changed. He was the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he will be the same tomorrow. The difference is that he came and brought us a better covenant in this dispensation. He is still the same God. When he says, wives, submit to your husbands, that's exactly what he means. I know that's terribly unpopular and terribly politically incorrect in this day of society. Because immediately, because of the direction we've gone, we immediately think of dictatorship. God never spoke of dictatorship. He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. What did he do? What did he do with the church? He was the founder of the church. He built the church, laid his life down for the church, and provided for the church all provision that that church would ever need to survive e the, 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 the eternity. Okay? Wow. I sat down with people that were getting ready to get married. I said, are you ready to marry her? Because if you're not, you need to just back this off a little bit. 
Oh, she's got a job, and I got a job. No, no, no. Can you provide for her? Can you take care of her? Because marriage is not man's, that's not man's thing. Marriage is God's thing. There's two institutions on the planet that are God's, church and marriage. Those are his institutions. Now we can manipulate them all we want to, but when it comes down to it, they're still his. And if they're broke, we probably ought to go back to the one who instituted them and find out why they're broke. It's because we took them over. Man has a tendency of everything we touch. That's why God said when he, when he gets inside of us, he said, now everything you touch, I touch. Everything you put your hands to, I put my hands to. I like it better that way. How about you? I can tell you business people right here in this church, they'll tell you, I like it better that way. I like it better. Since I found this new way, I like this a lot. It's like it just keeps coming to me rather than me having to work so hard for it. There were many covenants in the Old Testament. Many covenants. One of those covenants cut, God told them, says, from this day forward, you will, you will toil for thorns and thistles. That's a tough covenant, ain't it? Do you know what happened? He didn't put that on them. He was just letting them know where they stood because they, they gave up their authority. They gave up their place. He said, now that you gave up your place, now the covenant I got with you now, the covenant I had with you before, you ruled and reigned. Now the covenant, I, now the covenant you got now, and you've chosen it. So many times we don't realize how hogtied we have made his hands throughout the years. Because of our choices. Now the good thing is you can change your mind. And the good thing is God never changes. That's the awesome part. He never changes. So if he never changes what he thought about you before he found you is the same way he thought about you when he found you and it's the same way he thinks about you now. After he's found you and you messed up thinking he's probably thinking differently about me now. He's probably changed his mind. It's probably too late for me. He's probably, you know, he probably got something else for me to do now because I, I really messed that. No. No. What God planned in the beginning is what he's got planned now and what he's got planned in the future. Why does he not change? For our, well, because he's God. And for the benefit for us. This whole world, what makes it such a challenge for us, is it's changing all the time. One of my largest challenges every two to three years is a new phone. And, and I mean, I get a new phone, Pat knows I'm shut down for almost two weeks. I just hate going to something new. And when it comes to technology, I am not savvy at all. I might look like it. That's because I have somebody who's tutored me on this phone for almost three years now. And it's starting to mess up. And you know what it means when it starts to mess up. Every time it messes up now, I'm just, I'm sad. <laughs> because I know, I know there's a guy behind the counter somewhere who's getting ready to give me another phone. And I'm going to hate his guts that day. <laughs> I'll ask Jesus to forgive me as I walk out, but I'm going to hate his guts when I'm there because he's going to tell me this is, and they always tell you, we'll download everything for you. And then you get it home and it's not downloaded. It's not there. Where is it? It's in cloud. I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. But the one thing in my life that I do have is, is, is my father who never changes. If he changes my thoughts to his thoughts on any area, I know those will still be his thoughts tomorrow. And it doesn't matter what challenge I run into, he still feels the same about it. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how deep or how, how deep the ocean or how high the mountain that I'm up against, he doesn't change on his opinion. Amen? 
I just got to figure out, do I need to be believing him for a boat or do I need to be believing him for an airplane to get me through this challenge? We don't look at the challenge and freak out about the challenge. We keep our focus on him. He will never change on us. Amen? So we have a better covenant. Watch what this says in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 and 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Who's the mediator? Who's the go-between? See, I, I want all of you to know and understand that if you have a situation in your life, circumstance, something comes up that, that you need you need me, I, I want to I wanna try to always be available to you. Those of you who have called upon me, I, I've done my best to be there for you. Okay? But my job here is not to be the mediator between you and God. That is not my job. My job is to teach you to have a relationship and I hope you have a better relationship with him than I do. I hope I teach you so well that you grab a hold of something that I had to go out and search for. You get it, you get it freely right here and it takes you to higher heights and, and greater, greater depths with God, with, with your Father. I do. Because see, the, the, the deeper and closer relationship you have with him, it gives you the answers not just for yourself but for the fellow man that's around you. Amen? See, the whole idea is to, to, to get you matured in Christ at whatever level you're at, to get you at a higher level with Him, a closer level with Him, so that whenever you run across people in your life and God draws you to them, that you have the answers. Now what's funny is you still get drawn to them. That's why the Bible says that we should prepare ourselves so that we can be instant in season and out of season, right? How many of you have ever been out of season? But then when you tap into to, to, to what the Holy Spirit's wanting to say to that individual, all of a sudden they're not, they're not in the way any longer. They're not an inconvenience any longer. You tapped into his strength and you begin to pour out to them and witnessing to them and talking to them and teaching them something and you're talking to them, you don't even realize that you're saying things exactly what they need to hear. And, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're, you're answering the questions they've been having. Amen? But see, to get that, you've got to receive something to get that. Okay? You have to receive something to be able to pour something out. I say, what I am not is the guy that you call because you don't want to receive anything. You don't want to let, receive it. And then you call me because God's dealt with you about somebody. So you call me on the phone and say, Hey, I need you to go visit so-and-so. Or who's so-and-so? I don't know them. I barely know you. You know? But what is it where... Well, you just need to... You just need... You just need... To, no. I, I don't... They didn't cross my path. Now, if God deals with you about that, I'll go run. But I'm probably going to call you up and tell you to meet me there. Amen. Amen. This is how pastors get worn out trying to be the mediator. They run every time somebody calls and says, go here, go here, there, go here, go there. And, and I, I, I'm not... I'm, I'm preaching the choir here, so I'm not, I'm not getting on to anybody. I'm just trying to help you understand. We have a mediator, and a man is not it. You can't sit in the booth, rub beads, and say how many, however many Hail Marys. You can't, it doesn't, it, it just is not going to, that's not going to work. Because that, you're trying to use a mediator between God and man. And there's only one mediator, and his name is Jesus Christ. There's only one mediator. And, we, and, and that's one thing God told me when I first called me and I felt 
It's a, it's, you can feel it. It's like a mantle that steps that, that, that rests upon you. Because a, he, and it, and it happened here just another, again here just a few weeks ago. Um, we, we got the deal on the building and, and, and everything was starting to come together and, and now we were concerned maybe the buyers, when the buyers came back, they were really aggressive right now trying to get this thing closed. And when we came to that point, I'm driving down the road, and God, just like it was the first time in front of the bathroom mirror, God, I felt God, I felt something just rest on me. And he says, I'm about to give you influence with an audience. I thought, whoa, we, we, better, we better walk softly. We better kick off our shoes. Better walk like barefooted priest here. Because there's a responsibility because you're talking to human souls. That still doesn't make me the mediator. <laughs> still doesn't make me the mediator. I still know my place. That was something he told me right out of the gate. First, when, I, when I received this call, he said, don't you ever forget. I'm God, you're not. Jesus is the mediator, and you are not. They will try as they may and try as they might. You don't allow that to happen to yourself. You know what happens when you do that? You end up weakening yourself because you're running everywhere and you're not resting in Him. And, you're, and what you try to do is you take it over other people's responsibility of the lives that's been crossed in their path. And their responsibility was to go someplace and receive something powerful enough to meet the need whenever those paths got crossed. He's the mediator. We're under a better covenant. And I'm telling you, every one of you are ministers of this gospel. You're a kingdom of priests. And what you receive, you can freely give. It's yours. Amen. And you can freely release it into other people's lives. And you don't have to say it like me. You don't have to say it like anybody else because God's chosen you and he's put people in your path because they will hear your articulation. It is out of your mouth they need to hear it. Because they won't get it any other way but through that kind of personality, that kind of derelict, del 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 not derelict, but dialect. <laughs> <laughs> I know some things, not everything, okay? And I'll butcher something really good here, but you just bear with me. I'm glad we can all laugh at me right now, okay? <laughs> Why is this new covenant a better covenant? It's because of the sprinkling of blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. It's because of the blood. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, can I give you a little bit of something here? I don't, I'm not going to get it all. We'll get it next week. Um, I, I want you to look at something here and, and, and we're going to go there and I'll, I'll go to the next step next week. But go with me to Luke chapter 4. Very interesting. Luke chapter 4. It's fun. I love preaching this gospel. I love doing what I do I um I you, you study you write down notes um he stirred in me some of this stuff this morning and I got here had coffee and donuts but I had to go back there and rewrite some stuff because he was changing it this morning and as he changed it um then you just pray that he'll speak through you you know because I, 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 I'm going to tell you, when, when, when that person crosses your path, that's the smartest thing you could do at that point. Smartest thing you could do. You can just say it, you can say it inside yourself because where is Christ? He's inside of you, right? Amen? And you can speak to him. 
he knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So if he knows the thoughts and the intents, then he knows what you're thinking. So you can stop for a moment and say, Holy Spirit, please speak through me. Don't let this be me. You talk through me. You give understanding. Help them. I'm just here, a vessel for you to pour out. Amen? But to be poured out, you've got to have something in you. Amen. Can I tell you one really interesting thing about this new covenant? That if we're not careful, we're still trying to live in the old covenant. In the old covenant, he was God. In the new covenant, he is Father. The Bible calls him Abba Father. Do you know what the translation of that is in their language? Daddy. Daddy. Abba, Daddy. See, if you're still trying to relate to him in the Old Testament as God, then you don't understand the benefits of the mediator Christ Jesus and the blood shed and the covenant that was paid for you in this new covenant. See, he always wanted to be called Daddy. It's what he always wanted. He always wanted children. He wanted relationship and fellowship with children. And we're the ones, humanity is the one that rejected that. So let's be careful that we're not still rejecting what he wants. There's times that I, you know, throughout this whole thing with the building, there's been lots of things come up that God is just doing stuff that, you know, I'm not having to ask for. And so it's, it's building to the point where they're sending me now, they're sending me bids. And I'm not scared anymore. I'm not even bothered by it. Because he is, he is answering every need we have as we step through. I know he's going to answer these needs. Amen? Now I look at some of that stuff and I go, you've got to be kidding me. I call somebody once in a while and say, hey, really? A, a door costs that much? <laughs> yeah, they're expensive. <laughs> well, that was a wellspring of information. But, you know, but I don't get fearful. Because you've got to have a door. And this ain't my house. This is your house. Not your house. His house. Amen? You must be coming up with some door money. <laughs> Amen? Because they won't let me open it up without them. I'm telling you, folks, as we just re rest in Him and, and move with Him, He builds us up and encourages us to be bold as lions. Amen? Harmless as doves. Amen? Watch what he says here. Luke chapter 4, verse number 6. And the devil said unto him, And the devil said unto him, All power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. The devil's telling Jesus. Who's Jesus? He's the Word. Who's the Word? Jesus. I think this is really interesting because Jesus' answer, he said, if you'll worship me, Jesus never rebuttals the power that he has at this point. Did you notice that? He never rebuttals that. He never disputes that with him. He said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. Why would Jesus not confront him about this power issue? Because Humanity had relinquished the power that God had given them, and Satan swooped it up. 
He swooped it up. Jesus came to give that power back to us. Watch what he says over here. He goes through this fast, the 40-day fast, and in, in, in Luke 4 and or Luke 9 and 1, look how this story begins to change as he, uh, he talks to his disciples. Luke 9 and 1. So then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom. What did he send them to preach? The kingdom. You know, it's, it saddens me that, that, that we all we have to tell people about Jesus Christ, all we have is to tell them about what my preacher says and what our church looks like and what kind of music we have. That's a sad, that's a sad, sad, sad... He says, he says, to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I tell you what, if we get a hold of the kingdom of God, healing the sick won't be a problem. Watch what he says here in Luke 10, 19. One chapter over. 10, 19, he says, Behold, he said, oh, what? no, go up to 18, I love 18. 18 is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. What I want you to understand is, Jesus did not regard... Although man had given up his authority, Jesus did not give up his. Man gave up theirs, but Jesus did not give up his. And when Satan addressed Jesus as, I have all power and all authority and I'm going to give it to you as it's been given to me, Jesus did not reply to that because that was nonsense talk. We somehow have, have believed that this, this demonic force and its leader, Satan, Lucifer, the fallen angel, has got some kind of unique power and authority over us. He has power. He has some power. But he has no authority to use it. None. He doesn't have any. The worst thing you can do in a workplace is give somebody a bunch of power that is not prepared for it and then give them authority to use it. Man, they just, they, they, you lose all your good people overnight. God did not give him, he placed the authority in Christ. You now carry that authority and you have power now over his power. Amen? Watch. Luke 10, 19, let's look at this. He says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power. Now that word right there, that word power right there, this linking here in the study of this scripture, let me say it this way. Behold, and I'm going to say it this way because it's scriptural, okay? Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the ab and, and ability, ability over all the power and authority of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing, no thing shall by any means. Now there is a double enunciation here. He said, and nothing shall hurt you. He could have just said, nothing shall hurt you. But he said, nothing by any means. There's, there's not going to be any ability because by means would provoke authority. You can have the power, but your authority gives it means to be functional. Okay? You can have power to get something from point A to point B, but unless you have the authority to get that to travel, you know, you're going to travel, you're going to take it by train, boat, bus, or whatever, but if you have no authority over that train, boat, or bus, you can't get it there. See, he 
Savior by any, by any means, nothing, by any authority, can harm you. When we begin to understand the cancer cell has no authority, see, we're trying to tell the devil, look, Satan, you get out of, you get out of my body. Satan ain't in your body. You're a holy temple. What he has done is he has sown a thought or he has brought you through a lineage. He has tainted your bloodline. He is this and this and because of sin in the world and sin in the world and, and working on us because because sin brings death. And so we didn't have any of this before sin entered in the world. And so it's by authority. That's why I tell you whenever you get still, I started feeling the flu coming on this last week. You know, that, that it starts getting scratchy, and it starts getting your sinuses. That's how it works on mine, my sinuses. And it started working on me, and I knew my ear, this ear was starting to itch and hurt. And I thought, here we go. And I grabbed my Bible because here's the deal. There's where my authority is. It's in borrowing his words. And I don't sit and try to build a sermon on that. I don't sit and try to do anything with that. I sit and receive that authority because that authority in these words, what do you say? The entry of these words bring healing to your body. I just receive them because they have more authority than the flu bug who's trying to attach itself and do its full three day, five day, or whatever work. Now, since that knowledge that I've received this, have I been sick since then? Yes. And you know why most of the time I get sick since then? Because I know I can feel it coming on. All of us can feel it coming on. And you know what? I get too busy to do that. And what the end result is? I'm sick for a few days. And the whole time I'm sick, I'm going, geez. Well, either I stop for a second and rest in this and let the authority of God's word take authority over the, over the sickness and disease, the sin in this world, who's attached himself to my body, either I sit down and take a moment and let that happen, or it's going to set me down and I'm going to take a moment anyway. Amen. I would rather, and this is just where I'm hand, I mean, this is something I've progressed in. It's not something that was one message and I got that. And I'm not throwing a condemnation on anyone who's had the flu this year. I'm trying to get us to laugh at one another because you know you just didn't take out time. Now you knew this. You knew this. But you just got too busy. You didn't neglect it. You didn't say, I, you didn't reject it. You didn't believe something else. You knew. But we just got too busy. Amen. If I could get young believers, and I can get them in this scripture, I know a man who raised up a church and raised that church up for over 50 years. I think it was over 50 years. There wasn't one person sick or feeble in that church, not one day. That's its testimony. When I read that, I thought, that's possible. But it was training up people inside that church to believe that. And when they begin to believe it and begin to begin to take their authority. See, taking authority is the means of operation to get there. You had the power all along. Because he's given you power over all of it. But the authority to inst to, 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 to activate your authority, well now you gotta do something. Because that's the means of getting it done. Well, what do you gotta do? I just told you receive. You stop and you receive. I used to think Floyd it had to be a certain scripture. And I found out it doesn't matter. I could go that Bible anywhere. <laughs> I could read the begats and, and, and that's all I need. Because there's just that much power in God's word that the begats will get you healed. Amen. Because the begats are telling you about a whole new bloodline. 
getting ready to take place. Wow. Is that all right? Does anybody need prayer today? Hey, we'll come into agreement with you right now if you're in the middle of that flow. Or two or two or three gathered together, touching one thing, we'll rebuke that thing right off of you. So if you need prayer this morning, we're here to pray for you. I'll get back to more of this, but you've got a better covenant. Amen? You've got a better covenant. Hallelujah. you got a better covenant. Amen? And there is, we've got to begin to treat this like we say it is. If God is all powerful, his words are all powerful. If we've got a book full of his words, we're carrying some power here now. That's some power right there. I mean, there's some stuff right there. It'll shake hell. Amen? It'll wake up a nation. It'll rebuke the devourer off your life. You begin to believe. I'm telling you, I was going to tell you all ago, I'm going to just give you a prayer to pray. I pray it here lately all the time, and I'm just amazed at how fast I'm just receiving what I need in what we're doing for the, min for the ministry moving out, out to that property. I, I'm just taking out time saying, hey, Papa, I had somebody say this to me one day walking across the parking lot. He's wanting some cake. I deliver a little baby cake. And Bob, Bob, he, he's got, he had, at that time he had several gas stations. And I was walking by and he said, hey, hey, Bubba. I turned around, hey, Bob, how you doing? He said, show me the love. Show me the love. I knew what he wanted. I reached that truck and I threw him a box of cake from here to the doorway there. He said, there, now you love me, don't you? Like that, he walked on. He asked, show me the love. His heart's desire was a piece of cake. Now, this is what, later on, this is what God showed me. He said, what he wanted was a piece of cake. You threw him a piece of cake and he received a piece of cake and he says, now you love me. And he just walked on. I showed him the love. I'm telling you here lately, I've just been saying, when I, when I come up against something, well, I got that. Do you know what they want for doors on that building? <laughs> I mean, I keep bringing up the doors, but I'm telling you, it's really disturbing me. <laughs> it's just a door. It's like $15,000 for, th for, for three sets of doors. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking like 389 at Lowe's, you know. <laughs> and it's steel, my glass. I got that thing and I said, Papa, show me the love. Papa, show me the love. You know when that first worked for me? When I said, I don't want to be the guarantor on this thing, you have to show me the love. And the banker called and said, hey, you don't have to be the guarantor on this thing. Your ministry will be. Wow. I'm not, I'm not, that's not a formula. I'm in really in my heart. You're going to have to show me the love on this because I'm telling you, I can't do this. You're going to have to show me your love. You're going to have to show me your provision. See, his love is, his provision's all wrapped up in his love. Show me the love. Show it to me. I'm telling you, he's showing up. Amen. You got to try that sometime. Hey, Papa, just show me the love. Show me your love. He wants to. He wants to. He wants to. Get ready to receive. Get ready to receive. Get ready to receive. Hey, Papa, show me the love. Maybe some of you have never seen his love. Maybe you've only seen rejection. But that's not God. That's man. I'm telling you right now how to receive his love. Because he's already accepted you. He's never rejected you. Amen. And he wants the opportunity to show you Yes, you can read in Scripture, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sometimes words are cheap, though, whenever you're going through, you know? 
Amen? Show me the love. I know in my life, sometimes I needed my dad to do more than just say, I love you. Felt good when he grabbed a hold of me and hugged me. You know? Put a new set of tires on the car or something, you know, that just let him know, I love you. I'm here for you. You know? Amen? Just tell him, hey, show me the love. Show me the love, Father. Amen. Praise God. Be blessed.